The following podcast is sponsored by Structure Tech. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech presentation. My name is Bill Ulrich, alongside Tessa Murray and Ruben Saltzman. As always, your three legged stool coming to you from the Northland, talking all things houses, home inspections, and anything else that's rattling around in our heads. On today's episode, We had a really fun conversation with Phil Whiteford. He's the owner of Omega Force Appliance Repair based out of Rogers, Minnesota. You can find them on the web at omegaforceappliancerepair.com. You can check out Phil on LinkedIn. He's got all his contact information there. So if you have any questions, but we broke down every major appliance in your house and what the most likely repair you would see as it relates to each of these appliances. We also talked a little bit about dryer vents. Phil shared some information about dryer vents that I wasn't aware of. And I know Ruben and Tessa were kind of both raising their eyebrows too. Also, we talked a lot about a warranty program that his company is offering. And this is really a powerful tool for a real estate agent or a new home buyer. So many times in the past, we as home inspectors would get complaint calls about an appliance not working. And there's testing that we do, but it's not the same type of testing that you're going to do when you use an appliance over and over and over again, where you go from a small load of laundry to a big load of laundry. And you really find out how well your appliances are working once you're using them on a regular basis. So they've got a great warranty product. I encourage you to really pay close attention to that. This was a fun conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Bill, meet Phil. Phil, Bill. Do you own the company, Omega? I do, yes, sir. How long have you had it? Uh, started July 2013, so coming up on nine years. Nice. What was your background before you got into, into Omega? I've pretty much always done appliances in my professional career. I started, went through training back in 2003. That's really when I got into it. Pretty fresh. I went to Dunwoody for heating and cooling. And long story short, ended up doing appliances. What led you to that? I was working at Best Buy while I was going to Dunwoody. And I was able to transfer, stay at, stay at Best Buy, and then switch over to doing the appliance trade. Sounds like uh, education plan was just like mine. I'm nowhere near where I started. Well, you are because you're, you're actually in a related field, but I started one thing and then made a left turn and I'm way off in a different land. But anyway, it's good to meet you, Phil. I appreciate your time today and we appreciate you. All right. Well, let's get into it. Well, you know, Bill, I want to I want to just set this up because yeah. we've had a few people come back and ask me where that podcast was. We had done a podcast with someone on Phil's team, Nate, about a year ago. It was a little over a year ago. And he waxed on appliances. We talked about a lot of different stuff. And Phil got a hold of that podcast. And he was like, you know, it's mostly all good information, but there's a few things. Here's my top list of uh, 98 items that I didn't quite agree with. No, I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but uh, there was a handful of things where Phil was like, well, this isn't quite right. And I don't know if I want that information out there coming from us. And I was like, you know what? Let's just scrap that podcast. We'll, we'll throw it in the dumpster. We'll put it on ice or something and we'll do another one. We'll record another one with you, Phil, and we'll get it exactly the way you want it to represent Omega. I don't know. Time gets away from us. And I had completely spaced it until somebody used your company for an appliance repair. And she's like, Nate was out of my house. He was awesome. This is the only company I'm ever using for appliance repairs. I got their name from your podcast. And I wanted to share your podcast with some other friends because I just want them to know who these guys are. And I can't find it. And that just kind of jogged my memory. Oh, shoot. We need to get these guys back on and do another one. And we got a lot more questions now. So that's the prep for why we're having you back on. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Well, and also as, as home inspectors, we don't get a lot of complaints, but when people do call, oftentimes it's about appliances. And as appliances have become more technical and smart in all of the other things, it just seems like they might outsmart us. And I have lots of questions about how do you properly test an appliance? And as a home inspector passing through a house to quickly to see if something's functional, how do we actually give it a blessing? And can we? And because my sense is that would take its own amount of time, which we don't have in the inspection period, so to speak. I'm kind of excited to ask a lot of questions, Phil. What is the single most common appliance repair 
you guys deal with? We see tons of ice maker and ice maker dispenser issues. They, uh, especially now that the ice makers in a lot of cases are up in the fresh food section, it just adds a whole, uh, you know, another amount of complexity to get that space where the ice maker is, you know, chilled properly. There's been class action lawsuits on them and all kinds of stuff. It's just, it's been a challenge for sure. Is this brand specific or is this across the board? There is, I think every manufacturer at some point has probably had an issue that's been pretty well known with an ice maker in the fresh food department. The most well-known one right now is Samsung has a class action lawsuit out on theirs. For a lot of theirs, the, you know, it's one year bumper to bumper warranty, but in some cases they're taking care of the fridge repair or the ice maker repair up to six years, but it's an expensive repair. It's $600. They have a kit that includes a new circuit board, a new ice maker, some new plastic parts, some new metal clips. You have to reseal the whole ice maker cavity. So it's pretty extensive. So if you call them and sweet talk them, in some cases they're you know covering it, you know the whole thing. Frigidaire had an issue with their ice makers. Uh, the, that cavity wasn't insulated properly and some stuff was freezing up there and they didn't have a repair for it. If it was before five years or was newer than five years, they'd replace the fridge. It's so older than five years. They tell you too bad, so sad. Whirlpool has a, a kit out for theirs, comes with a whole gob of wires and sensors. And they essentially just redo everything in that whole ice maker compartment. You know, an issue that's spread across the industry quite a bit. So let me ask you, is there anything that homeowners can do to help prevent these issues from cropping up? Or is this just a manufacturing defect or a design flaw and you're just stuck with it? There are design flaws. I mean, there's nothing you can really do about it. The stuff's just not designed right to start with. You design them right. Do you need more space? Do you need more insulation? Do you need, how, how could you do it that they haven't seemed to figure out? I think what happens is they test these things, you know, in, in their, you know, manufacturing facility and they test them in not real world circumstances and they don't test them for, you know, long enough. And uh, like in the case of Frigidaire, their insulation in the cavity gets some moisture in it and then eventually it breaks down and it's useless. They don't know that's going to happen when they're testing it for a few months or whatever they test it for, right? It takes years for that to manifest itself. And then that's when it becomes a problem. You know, some parts just prematurely fail. You know, again, the part will work great for a year while they test it or whatever they do. And then, you know, they just see a high failure rate after that. So then they'll come up with a redesign to, you know, come up with a new better fan or whatever is necessary to try and remedy the situation. Man, that's a, that's a good tip for any home inspectors listening to this podcast. It, it used to be that we wouldn't inspect appliances 20 years ago. We'd never do it, but it became more and more common for home inspectors to do it. Eventually, the ASHI standard of practice changed in 2014, and they incorporated this and they said, if, if it's an installed appliance, and there's a bunch of types of appliances, we won't get into that, but said, if it's an, an installed appliance, it needs to be part of your standard of practice. So we pretty much inspect all of them now. And ice makers are definitely one of those things we look at, but I never knew how expensive it was to fix it. I mean, I kind of figured you got a bad ice maker, it's going to be, you know, a couple hundred bucks to fix it, not close to a thousand. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, in a lot of cases, it's not that much, but in Samsung specific case, they have a kit out that includes a new circuit board and a new ice maker and some sealant and a bunch of other parts. So you essentially are redoing that whole upper ice maker cavity. And and so for that kit and all the labor involved, those are running like 600 bucks. So uh, a Whirlpool, if you just need an ice maker and that's it, nothing else. I mean, those can for sure be less than a couple hundred dollars. Okay. You know, Phil, just what's the average life expectancy for just a, like a a fridge that you would buy today? And I know it's going to be different across the brands, but just in general, what are you seeing? I don't feel like I can accurately answer that question. All we see is broken stuff. (laughs) So, (laughs) I mean, everything we see is broken. You know, LG has a class action lawsuit right now for their major compressor issue. So LG fridges are are, are not lasting, but again, it's only one specific compressor that they manufacture. And that's the only compressor we see is the broken ones. Yeah. Coming from you, it's got to be like, uh, I'd say three years on average. (laughs) Realistically, it's probably 15 or 20 years, but uh, again, I'm I'm not sure. Okay. It's funny. I, full disclosure, we have a European fridge. It's like a counter depth fridge and it's all we could get for the design of the kitchen that we had to deal with. Anyway, this thing is going on eight, nine years old. Ice maker gives out. And before I knew that Omega existed, I just went to the, the store where I bought it and I had their people come out and they looked at it and they're like, yeah, the Europeans think we're crazy with wanting to make ice. And 
they just don't have any parts to fix this thing. Apparently it's a wiring harness that gets brittle and breaks and there's just nothing they could do about it. So, but maybe Phil, maybe you guys can come out and do some handiwork on it and get this thing going again. You know, we're doing free video diagnostic calls right now. So this is a great case where you can call in. We'll get you linked up with a video chat to a technician. Jared does it. He's been doing it 29 years. He would look at, hear what you have to say and see if he can come up with a solution to fix it. And maybe we can, maybe we can't. I mean, it just depends on, you know, what we find. Whoa. That's awesome. I have no idea. That's super cool. Is anybody else in town doing that? Not that I'm aware of. Wow. So, was, that a, was that a response to, to the pandemic, Phil, or is that just? It was a response to a couple one-star reviews we got where they complained about how they told us what the issue was over the phone and we should have been able to diagnose it over the phone for them. And we didn't. And so we go out to the house and we're like, oh yeah, this is like a known issue. And so now we try to catch those up front and not ever send a tech out to the house. Wow. So we, we probably do about five free calls a day where people call us in and we're like, this thing's not worth fixing, or these parts are no longer available, or this is going to be expensive. You know, you want to think about it. So makes, uh, customers love it. It's been great. That makes that a lot an of amazing sense. service. Save people the trip charge. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then they're going to call you on the next one. Yeah. Well, yep. hopefully. Is there anything else with fridges, as long as we've touched on fridges that have, are known pain in the, in the butt, or is it just a compressor goes out and the ice maker goes out? They're generally the most complicated and complex appliance in a house these days, and they just continue to get more and more complicated. You know, a fridge used to have one compressor, and now some newer ones have two compressors. You know, they used to have one sensor, and now some of them have 10 sensors. So it's just really going crazy. Some of them have four fans in them. You know, they used to have one. So it's just changed substantially in the last, uh, last five, 10 years. All right. I'm going to open myself up to criticism from you. I, I got my, uh, I've got a refrigerator in the garage and I've always read that you shouldn't keep your refrigerator in the garage because when it's zero outside and it's cold in your garage, your refrigerator is not going to be happy. What's your take on putting a fridge in the garage? So most manufacturers, if you read the owner's manual, it will tell you in there that the unit needs to be in an ambient air temperature above 55 degrees. Okay. Some of them say 40 degrees, but as you know, Minnesota garages get, you know, way colder than 55 or even 40. But what happens is, now it depends on the type of fridge you have, but some older fridges with, you know, top mount, you know, freeze up top and fresh food on the bottom. If you have that thing set for 37 degrees, which is, you know, your normal fridge temp and your garage is at 20 degrees, the thing will never turn on and cool. And so therefore the fans don't run to circulate air. And uh, then on top of that, it still goes into defrost mode every eight hours. So it turns on a heater in the freezer to melt the frost in there. And then as long as the fresh food section is cold, it will never turn the thing on and cool it again. So you really get what it turns out to be is like a fresh food section on top and a fresh food section on the bottom. It just doesn't freeze properly. So a chest freezer works in a garage just fine. An upright freezer will work in a garage just fine. And even some standalone fridges will work in a garage okay. It's when you get the combination of the fridge and freezer is when you run into issues. Okay. All right. Very I, interesting. I had no idea about that. <laughs> yeah. Does it hurt refrigerators to go and just be unplugged in the garage and sit out there in 45 degree below zero temperature on a regular basis? Or do you just plug them back in and they work fine? As long as there's an, any, the, the only concern about a fridge getting cold is if you have any water in it. So water valves will crack and tubing can crack and that kind of stuff. But as long as there's no water in it, then there really is not a concern. Now, one of the things that I've run into at my house is this front-loading washing machine. And I know, and some people on our inspection team have, have tried to test them and they've been outsmarted by these machines. Sometimes they have load sensors and it looks like they ran, but they didn't run. And so we've had some complaints at a point in time. What's the deal with front load washers? Why did the, anybody think these were a good idea? And what kinds of problems do you typically see with the front loads? I don't know why anybody thought they're a good idea, to be honest. They're way more problematic than top load washers. They, they, just the, the whole engineering piece of them. <laughs> you know, a top load washer, if the lid doesn't close right, right, no big deal. On a front load, right, you can flood a house. And we've seen it many times because someone just doesn't get the, you know, door closed right. So... I'm not a fan of them. I think most people in the industry are not a fan of them. They just cause so many problems. But I think really the only way to test it, at least from an inspection standpoint, is to 
put five bath towels in there and let the thing run and see if it goes all the way through and spins them out at the end. There's really no other way to do it. If it's empty, it can work just fine. It can sound okay and go all the way through and it looks good. But once you get a load in there, the thing can, you know, shake too much to the point where it just won't allow it to complete the cycle. And there's really, it's not any way to know that that's going to happen other than putting a load in there. And, and it also puts in more water. The bigger the load is, the more water they put in. So if you have a machine that's draining slowly and, it, and you don't have anything in there, it's going to have a low volume of water and it may be able to drain that out just fine. But then if you have a larger load in there with a larger volume of water, it will not be able to drain that out. So most front load washers, when it goes to drain, it will drain for about 10 minutes. And if it still sees water in the machine after 10 minutes, it'll give you an error code. And so depending on the size of the load, it can, you know, vary that volume and then determine if a error code is going to come up or not. So you, you just uh, poked holes in the way that we currently test things, Phil, because we've, we've adapted our testing process and procedure, you know, quite a bit over the last few years. And currently what we do is we throw like a bath towel in the washer and put it through a cycle. But what you're saying is it needs to be a heavier load to really test it. You need like five towels or something. Yeah, if you read the owner's manual for one, it tells you that you can't have a light load in there in some cases. And if light, the load is too light to add bath towels to help counterbalance the load. There, in most of these machines, there isn't anything to counterbalance it, right? So if you have two towels in there, you need one on each side of the drum mm -hmm. to counterbalance each other so it can spin out. So if you have one towel in there, it's light enough, it might be able to do it, but it's for sure not ideal. But two towels, again, I don't think it's heavy enough to really test the suspension in it and make sure the thing is up to snuff to handle a decent sized load. Wait, wait a second. Suspension. That sounds like my truck. I mean, what, <laughs> what, what are we looking at inside of a front load washer? So it's a suspension, much like a truck. There's underneath, all of them have three or four shock yeah. absorbers, just like a vehicle has. And then they have two springs up in the top that suspend it, you know, or make it hang from the top. Some of them will have some counterbalance weights in there to help reduce some vibration, but it's really, I mean, it's pretty simple. There's not much to it. Does anybody or any manufacturers that you're really impressed with how they build their suspension and you, you think, yeah, this one is more solid than others? We really don't see any problems with the, with the suspensions these days. They, the anti-vibration from all the manufacturers have, have gotten substantially better. When I first started doing this, we would get so many complaints from people having a machine upstairs and it would just sound like it was shaking the house to pieces. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. that has been eliminated a lot but it's still not as good as, and it still shakes more than a top load washer does, but it's come a long ways. That's for sure. Now, what about the stink that you get with some of those washers? Like, I mean, you get people who say, I always leave the door ajar. I always clean the filter. I drain the water out. I use the, the tablets and I'll put, you know, a fresh or whatever. You'll, you'll run the cleaning cycle every 30 days. You do everything that the manufacturer tells you, yet it still smells to high heaven. What is going on there and what can people do about that? Yeah, there's been class action lawsuits just for this issue and may take loss when I had to pay out some money for it. But it's a problem with every front load washer. I think it comes down to the amount of chemicals you're putting in the machine. So if you, now I've never done this, but maybe you guys have. If you don't wash your shower for a while, around the knobs, it'll turn like pink and orange. And that's your shampoo or, you know, whatever else in there, like getting slimy and getting kind of mildewy. You don't clean it long enough. It'll get, you know, into this nasty, stinky stuff. The same thing happens in front load washing machines. It gets this thick goo in there. If you're good about running a fresh on a monthly basis, like they say, it will, you know, should take care of that goo, but most people don't. Uh, they probably do it once every three years. It's a problem. But if you really watch soap, it will probably not be an issue. Consumers like to see suds in there and make them feel better. And so people like to put in lots of soap. Can you clarify what you mean by watch soap? Are you just saying use less than the bottle says to use and how much? Always use less than what the bottle says. I mean, they're in the business of selling soap. It really depends on how dirty your clothes are and how hard or soft your water is. The harder your water is, the dirtier your clothes are, the more detergent you can use. But if you have a water softener and, you know, most people wear their clothes once or twice and throw them in there. A, a good rule of thumb is two tablespoons, a two times concentrated detergent. Wow. Hmm. That's hardly anything. Yeah, it's not much. I'm getting wow. my black magic marker and I'm drawing a new line on my fill dispenser. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we're you done with this do podcast. <laughs> we have, uh, I'm pretty sure the cups that come in a, in a coffee can, you know, or, you know, Folgers or whatever. I think those are two tablespoons. Wow. So okay. you can use one of those. 
Okay, good. While we're on that, Bill, is it okay if we go away from washing machines? Because this this reminds me of dishwashers now. It's your podcast. You can do whatever you want, man. <laughs> You're the host, Bill. This is not my podcast. This is your baby. I, I'm wondering about dishwashers. I've heard that it's a problem adding too much soap to those too. Like most people use way too much. What's your thought on that? It's definitely a problem and we get calls for it. I mean, I've seen them before where it's like a cartoon and the soap is like oozing out on the floor because people put in way too much. But, but again, you have to use detergent based on how hard or soft your water is and how dirty or not your dishes are. Two teaspoons of detergent, a uh, powder detergent is good for most applications. You know, if you have really hard water, you know, or washing some really nasty stuff, you can put in more, but two teaspoons of detergent is really about all you need. How much detergent's in a packet? Yeah, I use the, I use those pre... Yeah, the pods. Yeah. Now those are not all detergent. Some of the stuff in there is, you know, like OxyClean and some of it is rinse aid. So that's not all detergent. I, I don't have that number for you. Just by looking at one, I would guess it's probably like three tablespoons, something like that would be my guess. Okay. They can be too much. The, the Cascade Platinum pods have been an issue. Generally, when we get calls, you know, for leaking or, you know, sudsing, and we see they're using that stuff, a lot of times that's the cause. So, and there's nothing you can do. You can't like cut those in half. So, I mean, you just have to switch detergent. Is there things that homeowners can do for just general, like in terms of maintenance to extend the life of their dishwashers? A lot of the newer dishwashers have a filter on them that needs to be cleaned out regularly. You know, if you just look under the bottom rack, there's a big thing in there that, you know, you grab it and turn it and pull it out. And, you know, there'll be food chunks and that kind of stuff in there. Other than that, not really. I mean, I went to a house where a guy washes, you know, the rocks from his aquarium and they just went everywhere inside the thing. So oh, no. uh, people just, uh, people just abuse them. So as long as you don't abuse them and, you know, clean the filter, if yours has a filter, you know, it'll be all right. Was this the first time that he washed his aquarium rocks or, or did he get lucky the first uh, time? Or just... I don't know, but I've picked so many aquarium rocks out of that thing. It was unreal. I think you answered my other questions though, because I was I was gonna say what goes wrong with dishwashers? They seem pretty bulletproof. Dishwashers are probably the second most common repair we see behind refrigerators these days. The government has done so much to try and make them more energy efficient. And in the process of that, they have really changed other things where the you know, they used to have these big, huge AC motors in them, you know, that weighed, you know, eight pounds. Now they have these little plastic things that are so cheap and uh th but they use no energy but you know an old dishwasher cycle be complete in an hour a new one every single new dishwasher is more than two hours for a normal cycle and it's because the motors are are so small they use you know just a little bit of water so the dishes are essentially soaking in there you know for an additional hour so that the things can actually get your dishes clean so they're more energy efficient there's no doubt about that and they use less water and all that kind of stuff but the quality of them has definitely you know, dwindled. I had an issue with mine where the detergent door went open, right? Like, and I went on YouTube and I found some component and I took my, I'm not a mechanical guy, but I took a stab at it. Seems to be holding together here two years later. Is, is that a common thing? Like, are there a lot of little plastic parts in there that are moving in dishwashers or was mine just kind of a weird one? It's tons of plastic parts. When I first started, I could not carry a dishwasher outside of a house by myself. They were so heavy. And now I can pick up a dishwasher and move it by myself, no problem. They've gone from lots of metal to lots of plastic. You know, that's just how they are. Do the repairs actually begin to make sense on units like this? Because dishwashers don't feel that expensive as, a, as an appliance. So is it pretty easy to go beyond 50% of the cost to repair it? Well, nowadays it's hard to get some appliances. So that number has changed just because of, you know, the current era we're in. You know, it depends on your situation. We go to some houses where they've put a tile floor in front of the dishwasher and you can't get the dishwasher out. So those people are willing to pay more for a repair so they don't have to tear up their floor and replace it. You know, if someone's handy, they might be willing to replace a dishwasher themselves, you know, so then they're going to be, you know, less likely to repair it. So it depends. Uh, you know, some people will have a complete matching kitchen suite. And they like that everything matches and looks the same. So they'd be willing to invest more in a repair, uh, you know, and some, you know, some Bosch dishwashers are $1,200, you know, so people, you know, obviously invest more in a repair in one of those. So it, it just my, depends my, on what it is. My pragmatic approach to cost is not always, not always accurate. Yeah. I, we can almost always repair something faster than somebody can replace it. 
So if you want that thing up and running quick, almost always fix it faster. Interesting. Now there again, I would have never expected you to say that. And that's not because of the current climate. That that was a general statement that applied before COVID hit and supply chains went completely nuts, right? Yes. We carry the top 300 parts on all of our vehicles. So we fix a lot of stuff first time we're out. And then we source more than 90% of our parts locally. So we can get parts and get back very quickly and repair stuff. Does that same sentiment apply to microwaves too? Just curious. Or, or when a microwave you know, stops heating up or stops working, do you just recommend replacing that? We service a lot of microwaves and uh, we cover them on our warranty. Some of them are really cheap to fix. You know, it's just a couple dollar part. But again, with a microwave, you have to get the thing installed. If it's countertop, for sure, throw it away. Yeah. But if it's an over the range one or built in one, some of the big box stores are charging like $175 to get it installed. Oh. So, you know, it can make a, a microwave get expensive quickly. But some of them, I mean, we just serviced a, a GE microwave the other day. That was a $2,500 unit. So, you know, it just depends on what you're talking about. Yeah. That, that was more than a microwave, right? That was a fan, an exhaust fan, probably built in, or was it just a microwave? No, it was a built in, meaning it's like screwed into the cabinets. It didn't sit above a cooktop, it's just a standalone microwave it has a wow. drop down door on it nice unit so we b- before the show we had traded some emails about clothes dryers and clothes dryer exhausts and some of the biggest problems you have there let's just dig into clothes dryers what type of stuff do you see going wrong with those besides the really obvious one if people don't clean their limb traps i'm sure you see that right we've gone out before and i kid you not pulled an inch of lint off of traps and, and- <laughs> Once you get to an inch thick, it can't even like collect any more lint. The fan's not moving in the air. So it's <laughs> things just at that point. But when they say to clean your, your lint, you know, filter every time, they mean every time. So you should definitely be doing that. Yeah. I can't believe somebody actually calls you out to service their clothes dryer and they haven't cleaned the lint trap. <laughs> the other thing with lint traps are is if you use dryer sheets, they have like a wax residue in there and that wax residue will build up on the filter and it will start to plug it up. You know, it'll reduce the size of the holes. I've seen some that are so plugged up with wax residue that you can put water on top of it and the water won't run through. Mm. It just Whoa. sits on top of it. So how do you clean so that? In the owner's manual, you get a brush and soap and just, you know, run under water and scrub it. That's, you don't have to do anything special. But every dryer manual tells you to clean that filter with soap and a brush, you know, periodically. Nobody does, but that's I what the no idea. Says. I'm going to clean mine today. <laughs> of course you will. <laughs> if you don't use dryer sheets, you probably don't need to clean it. The wax from the dryer sheets is what really <laughs> coats some things up good. Okay. All right. So you, would you advise against using the dryer sheets or would you just say, if you do it, clean your filter regularly? Make sure you clean your filter. Uh, I'm not a fan of li- liquid fabric softener in a washing machine. So if you're going to use something, I would go with the dryer sheets. Okay. And- and why is that? Is that just because of that gooey nature that will build up in your washing machine if you use liquid fabric softener? Or I think the more chemicals you put in the washer, the more likely you are to get the goo and the stink going in there. It just kind of slimes everything up and it's, it's gooey. It's really flammable. I'm just not a fan of it at all. Have you ever seen a washer start on fire? I've never seen a washer start on fire, but 60 Minutes did a thing a, a while ago where they washed baby clothes with fabric softener and then they lit them on fire and it's like they're gone oh Oh, wow it's like pouring an accelerant on your child and and, (laughs) wow yeah is there a warning on the bottle i don't know but it sure sounds like there should be (laughs) (laughs) and i've learned more things by accident honestly there's just (laughs) who would have thought that that it would be flammable but all right (laughs) <laughs> so phil do you have a recommendation for like dryer exhaust ducts to a certain type of material oh man this is a hot topic <laughs> literally so, <laughs> manufacturers recommend you can use two kinds of ducting one is the solid steel which is by far the best option there's nothing even close to it the other one that they say you can use is the semi-rigid pretty much every manufacturer that i've ever read it, a manual for says you can use those two and only those two. There's some discussion as to whether you can use foil vent. There's lots of confusion around it. Some people say it's okay to use it to go from the dryer to the wall. Um, I don't think there's ever a good reason to use it. The only reason to use it is to save time and money on installing the stuff. And I say, just do it right and just go all steel from the beginning. And in the long run, it's going to save you time and money. 
Yeah, the and just to touch on that, the way the code is written is that the dryer duct is going to be all rigid metal, just like you're describing. It's got to have a smooth interior. You can't even have screw heads po- poking into it that could catch lint. It's It's got to all be metal. But then for a, a different product called the dryer transition duct, you can use up to eight feet of a UL listed dryer transition duct. It needs to be UL 2158A listed. And, you know, in some cases, like at my house, I've got a dryer tucked way back in there and I don't have access from the top or either side. I mean, it is wedged in between the wall and my washing machine. I cannot get at it. And then it, it takes a turn. It's like, I, I don't have the skill <laughs> to, to line this up and have it all metal. So there is a small section of flexible in there and it's the shortest possible. It's, mm-hmm. it's probably four feet long. And I, I say, if you are going to use a transition duct, make it as short as you can possibly make it. And you know, the, the code allows a UL listed transition duct, but like you said, Phil, there's a lot of confusion over what manufacturers allow. And even I, I've read tons of manufacturers installation instructions, and even in the same manual from the same manufacturer, they'll say, don't use foil ducts, but if you're going to make sure it's UL 2158A listed. And it's like, what are you saying here? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've I've done tests on it. I'll I'll put a link in the show notes to a couple of blogs I've done on that. And I mean I've I've started them on fire. I've filled them with confetti with with shredded paper and and checked to see how they work. And I mean no question those foil ones burn through fairly quickly. If you've got a fire inside your duct, those foil ones probably will not contain it. It'll probably get out. Aside from the fact that they're probably much more likely to get clogged up with lint. One of the main issues we see with anything that's not solid steel is people get them installed back there. And then every time you close the door, it pushes the dryer back a little bit. Someone will lean on it. It'll push the dryer back and the transition ducts get squished. And so you go from having a four inch opening to, uh, I've seen some that are less than two inches because they've just been yes. so squished. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and then you have a dryer problem. You have a venting problem. And uh, I- I'm telling you, it- it's well worth it to invest the money to do a dryer vent right up for uh, up front. If, you're, if your dryer vent gets too restricted, the dryer will run hotter than it's, hotter than it's supposed to. Um, eventually, it will cause the dryer to fail. They say that 70% of dryer failures are because of poor vents. Mm. And uh, so... So if you have a, a heating element, for example, that heating element has to have so much airflow moving over it in order for the thing to not burn up. At some point, you choke the airflow enough that that heating element just burns too hot, and eventually it will just melt and fail. So now you have to fix the dryer, and you still have to fix your dryer vent issue. So it makes sense just to do it up front uh, and save yourself a, a dryer repair. Yeah. It's a, it's a big problem. So how hot is, is too hot for a dryer? Because... You know, one thing that we've tried to do for our inspections is to test the functionality of a dryer. And so we actually use that same towel, put it through, you know, through the dryer and turn on the heat. But should we be looking at like what, what's an indication that the dryer is not venting properly? Because we do everything we can to visually inspect the duct. But if it's going through, you know, a, a space that's not accessible, we can't always see what's going on. Yeah. So there's a couple of things you can do. We put we have like a digital probe that we put inside the dryer and we'll watch it turn the heat on and off. So when the dryer gets too cold, it'll kick the heat on. If it's gas, you'll hear the flame turn on. If it's, you know, electric, you'll hear the relay click and, you know, you'll uh, watch the temperature start to go up. And so it, most dryers will kick the heat on. And this is if you're measuring it inside the drum. At about 120 degrees, you'll watch the heat increase until it gets about 200 degrees. And then the heat will cut off and uh, go back down to 120, kick the heat back on. And it'll cycle through that, you know, a whole bunch of times you know, while the thing's running, obviously when you put a large mass of wet clothes in there, the heater's going to stay on longer at the very beginning, and then it will run less, you know, as the clothes warm up. But 120 to 200 degrees is a perfect temperature, and that's with a vent disconnected. As soon as you attach any sort of vent at all and change the airflow at all, it's going to run hotter. Every single time you hook up a vent, it's going to run hotter. And depending on what kind of vent you have is going to depend on, you know, how much warmer it's going to run. Generally, if you see something getting over 230, you're in the danger zone of it starting to blow a fuse or, you know, cause the problem in the dryer. But we have we have airflow meters. And so we'll put the airflow meter outside underneath the vent hood and see how many miles per hour we're getting of airflow out there. If we get more than 20, then that's acceptable. 
uh, less than 20, you're, you know, run the potential of having problems less than 16, you need to do something like right now. But if you put it right on the back of a dryer, I've seen it, you know, coming out of the back of the dryer as much as 35 miles an hour. So if you go from 35, you know, if you, if you have 35 out the back of the dryer, you hook it up to a vent and now all of a sudden you're down to 20, well, something's wrong, right? So the longer you do it, you can kind of get a feel of, you know, if this one's 35 and you go through 10 feet of duck, you know, what it should be when it's coming outside the house. But that's really the best way to check it is checking, you know, the miles per hour of airflow outside. Do you clean ducks as a part of your service? We clean, we do, I'm going to say minor duck cleanings or easy duck cleanings. We don't go up on roofs and uh, we don't do anything with second stories. So if you're, if your vent is coming, you know, exiting out the second story and we got to get, we're not doing that. We, we don't carry, you know, monstrous ladders in our vehicles, um, but we'll do easy ones, you know, go up and go out the side or whatever. Who does clean those? I mean, cause there are so many houses these days that we inspect where the dryer is, you know, washer and dryer located on the second floor and it, it dryer vents up through the attic and out through the roof or like townhomes, yeah. condos, like who should someone call to clean those? We recommend two companies for second story or roof vents. Donald's Ducks is a, <laughs> a cute name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, he's out of St. Michael. Huh. Okay. And um, that's kind of that part of the metro. And the dryer vent wizard is uh, out of Farmington. You know, they do as well. So Donald's duck, he just cleans them. Dryer vent wizard will do anything. So if you, okay. if yours is too small and you need to cut brick in your house to get a four inch vent in, they'll do that. You know, if it's disconnected in the attic or whatever, I mean, they'll, they'll do anything to get your dryer vent working right. I would have known that when my uh, friend in Farmington asked me to go on her, you know, roof that was 810 or 1010, whatever it was, and I'm up there, <laughs> like, shimmying down to this duck that it's 30 feet up in the air. Why the heck would you put the dryer termination on a roof that high, that steep? I was cussing this uh, contractor out. There's no reason for it. <laughs> you have it up on a roof. And it's nice and warm. Birds like the warmth, so they want to go inside the vent. So then you have to put a screen up there. The screens are not up to code, by the way. So then people want to put a screen up there to keep the birds out. But now you got to go up there and clean the screen. It's just it's a bad idea all the way around. Yeah, and not only that, but it's going to melt snow on your roof, and that can contribute to ice dams too. Mm-hmm. There, yep. There's a lot of reasons to not do it. Okay, houses have several thousands of dollars of equipment in them in the form of appliances, everything we've already touched on. I'm moving into a new house. Is there anything out there that I can buy that's going to protect my appliances from failure as I move from the last owner to me and just fingers crossed, hoping these things work? Are you uh, setting me up here with a softball question? Well, I, if, if you've got an answer <laughs> that's a softball, I'd love to take it. But I mean, I feel fortunate. We have we have uh, been lucky with appliances, right? And but I know a lot of people have moved in, and five days later, something major breaks. So, um, yeah. so we sell an appliance protection plan that uh, um, we have a sale going on right now. It covers eight appliances in your house for thirty dollars a month, and uh, these things are just huge in the metro area. One of our large um, Fortune five hundred competitors has over 200,000 customers in Minnesota on these contracts. So we've come out with our own. We're guaranteeing two-day service, recovering more parts, recovering more appliances. It's a local company. We answer the phone. I mean, today I'm looking at our phone board. We're averaging answering the phone in five seconds for everybody that calls. So it's really a top-notch service experience, and I guarantee you're going to be happy. Is that an insurance policy that's provided by ex mutual company and then you service it for them or how how does it actually work it's completely all done in house so we make all the decisions on what's covered and what's not covered we're not talking to anybody's insurance company where it's all done completely in house which is one of the reasons that it's a much better experience because we've done work for other companies where customer thinks something should be covered warranty company says no we're stuck in the middle somehow we always end up being the bad guy so we decided we just need to take control of this thing and, and just do it all ourselves. So, but, but our goal is to make everybody be super happy in the end and, you know, just have a, a real top notch, good experience. And, uh, um, you know, so that they, they want to stay with us. You know, I haven't asked about ranges. Are, are ranges something you guys are working on on a regular basis or do, again, are they a pretty solid piece of equipment? Uh, ranges are probably the least serviced item. There's some ranges have no moving mechanical parts. 
you know, some of them might have a convection fan, some might have a cooling fan, but there's really not much in them in terms of moving parts. The more complicated they get, the more we're servicing them, of course. You know, a lot of them now have complete digital controls for the burners where you hit numbers up and down, you know, so you can set your burner at number eight or seven or whatever on a digital display. And those things always add more problems than just your standard old fashioned, you know, knob and switch, but they're still the most reliable appliance out there. Okay. I got a troubleshooting question for you. Maybe you can help me fix mine. I've got like a, probably it's a 20 year old range and every once in a while, the igniter will stop working. It's like, I go to light the burner and there's just no clicking. Nothing happens. No matter what I do, I can't get it to click. So I'll get my little, my little, you know, candle lighter and I'll use that to light the flame and I'll do that for a couple of days. And then a few days later, I'll just try it again. And it magically works. What's going on? I'm assuming you're talking about a gas burner on the cooktop. That's right. So when you turn the knob, there's a little switch in there that energizes the smart module and that thing's failing. You need to replace it. Okay. All right, cool. So new knob. No, just kidding. <laughs> that would be nice. Not that easy though. <laughs> okay. Something tells me, Ruben, you're going to go find a YouTube video and try this out and I just probably might. record it. Yeah. I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah. Phil, I, I thought you were going to tell me that ranges were a big problem, especially the electrical circuit boards that are just above where the exit is for the, where the exhaust exit is on, on ovens, like those circuit boards, I thought you'd tell me those things heat up and melt all the time, but apparently not. Uh, we rarely see that. If it's a problem, they'll put a cooling fan by that circuit board to make sure it's cool. So, but in general, it's just, yeah, it's really, it's really not an issue. The, the biggest problem with ranges though is people using self-clean uh, ranges and ovens. You know, when you use self-clean, depending on the manufacturer, it'll heat that thing up to 900 degrees. And if you have a fan that's on the fritz or anything that's just not right in there, it'll it'll kill something in there. So we always recommend you never use them around holidays, even though that's when everyone uses them because they want to pretend like they have a real nice, you know, appliance before all their family comes and sees it. Yes. I had a neighbor who was doing that. They use the self-clean feature and it locks your oven shut and yep. there it was electric and their oven would not shut off. And they're like, Ruben, I don't know what to do. And we ended up like just shutting off the circuit breaker because there was nothing you could do. It was just locked on. And it had been that way for hours and they ended up having to replace it. I think they probably could have called you guys and got it fixed. I bet, huh? You know, we just had one that was a really old double wall oven and uh, the thing failed and it got stuck in the lock position, just like you were saying, and the lock's not available anymore, but we were able to get it unlocked so they can at least use it, but they can't use self clean on it ever again. So wow. sometimes there's some creative solutions to keep appliances going. Okay. Can you tell everybody what's the best way to reach out and talk to you about coverage if they want to, especially for new people moving into a house? Yeah, you can uh, reach us on the phone, 763-390-6267, or you can go to the website, omegaforceappliancerepair.com, and there's a link on top that says protection plans. Is, it, is this a certain home visit where you're going to come out and review every, what's in the house and then kind of build your plan based on that? You can pick as little as four appliances or, you know, do as many as you want, but we don't review anything. There's a question on there. It says, are they all in good working order? And we hope people are honest and check the box that they are in good working order. If they are, if they're not, then we would repair it and, you know, then come out there and, you know, and then they'd be able to sign up for the plan, but we have a discount going. So if you're going to sign up for the plan and something's broken, we give you a discount on the repair. That's gotta be a popular, a popular product that you sell. It's weird talking to people in the industry. It's like unheard of in other states, but for whatever reason, the, the, it's just huge in Minnesota. So, yeah, it is. Now, let me ask you, is there a waiting period? Like what if, what if somebody's fridge stops working, they sign up for your appliance repair plan for 30 bucks a month or whatever. And they're like, Oh, funny timing. It just quit working today. And I signed up yesterday. Do you have a waiting period to eliminate that kind of thing? If you read the terms and conditions, it says that there's a 30 day waiting period. Okay. However, we, we really want people to have a top notch experience, right? So if you call me and you say, Phil, I signed up for this two weeks ago and my fridge legitimately broke. I'm going to trust you and we're going to fix it. Okay. If can people scam us? Yes, they can. Right. You can sign up for your fridge. You can wait 30 days and then call in a broken ice maker, right? You can sign up for your fridge or for, for your range, wait 30 days and then call in your broken burner. So yes, people can take advantage of us. We hope people are honest and not do that, but it, you know, it's reality. 
it feels like every new purchase home buyer should just call you immediately and and get on that plan. It's just going to take some of that uncertainty out of that new house purchase, or at least until they know they want to replace their equipment. So people like it because they know exactly what the monthly payment is, and then there's no surprises. So you know you're not having to worry about getting a in the case of a Samsung ice maker, right? A super expensive repair mm-hmm. bill. It's just you you know you pay so much a month, and you know then hopefully you don't have any surprises at that point. Did we miss anything? I, I we talked about a lot in uh, Tessa. You got you go for it. One thing I was hoping we would get to hear from Phil today was one story from your history, your experience of working with appliances, like the craziest thing you've ever seen. So, so, so this is many years ago. I was at a customer's house and I was just there to fix. It happened to be an LG dishwasher. I don't even remember what the complaint was on it, but I opened up the door and I just about dry heaved in their kitchen. It, it turns out this thing had been sitting with water in it for nine months and it wasn't water oh. in the bottom. It was like this nasty uh, putrid, you know, fungus growing in there. It smelled just horrible. I don't know how they were living in the house with it. Oh. And so I told them I can't service this, and, uh, you know, but if you clean it up and make this thing, you know, look new, then call us, we'll come back and fix it. Sure enough, they cleaned that thing up. It was spick and span. And I went back and put a new dishwasher motor in it. What? So, that's awesome. Oh that's a good way. <laughs> but they they lived with it like that for nine months. Oh, yeah. man. I suppose. I'm imagining yeah. the worst front load dryer smell I've ever smelled. And then putting like a 10 times multiplier on it. Front load yeah. washer smell. Yeah. I've gotten used to the, the stinky front load washer smell. Some of those are pretty pungent, but this was way worse. <laughs> oh, man. You've got a tough job, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> My fingers would be cut up in perpetuity. Like I can't come next to go buy an appliance and not get cut on some sharp corner for some odd reason. So I've bled many a time in a customer's house. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Phil, I, I just want to thank you. This I learned so much during this podcast. Um, I mean, this is one of the better, better ones that we've had because just little tidbits. I had no idea. First of all, I didn't know there was a suspension in a front load dryer. And uh, there were all kinds of good nuggets in here. So thank you. We, we really appreciate your time. And especially for anybody listening, call Omega and get this warranty. <laughs> Move in your house and have confidence. And you don't have to worry about these, these things going sideways on you. So, 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 we- so I'm wondering if one of us misspoke, Bill. You said a warranty or, or you said a suspension in a front load dryer. Oh, um, no, I'm I misspoke. I misspoke okay. all right. as I tend to do right. in a front load washer. Yes. Okay. All right. I was going to say, oh, so, well, that's it. I think we should put a wrap on this every, we will link to Phil's company with the website, with the contact phone number, and uh, you can go over there and talk to them about their warranty. And of course, if something goes sideways and you're in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area, just uh, give Omega a holler because uh, it sounds like they can hook you up no matter what. How many, how many parts on your trucks? 300. And, and we, we just opened up the St. Cloud area too. So, oh, I don't know awesome. St. Cloud now. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, and thank you everybody for listening. You've been listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech presentation. My name is Bill Ulrich alongside Tessa Murray and Ruben Saltzman. We appreciate your time and we will catch you next time. For more information on how we can provide you with the right information about your home before you buy or sell, Contact us at StructureTech1.com.